Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. A sense of a neighborhood, a sense where people, it, it's a place for people and not just for cars. They slow you down for maybe the first three feet, but they just don't work. No license plates, a license plate that's three or four years old. The culture of prioritizing automobiles over others. If you've lived in St. Louis for a while, or you're a visitor seeking house-made sweets or an unabashedly bacony BLT, there's a good chance you know Crown Candy Kitchen. For 110 years, the classic STL spot's been serving happy eaters from its corner in the Old North neighborhood of St. Louis. Its ambiance and food have kept people coming back. But Crown Candy Kitchen's owner, Andy Karanzev, says something right outside his restaurant poses customers and neighbors with a serious threat. People drive with no regard for anything but themselves. And I tell people, you, don't, you shouldn't worry about getting shot in St. Louis. You should worry about getting T-boned. Now, drivers blast through that four-way stop where Crown Candy sits. That's not a new problem. As fast as the cars he's caught speeding by on camera, the city's response to Andy Karan's of safety measure requests has been slow, though there are signs change could be coming. And for years, I pretty much have just gotten, um, we're working on it, we're, we're doing this, we've got to do that, and I, and I just got a lot of smoke blown up my butt. And now, my new old person, Rasheen Aldridge, has assured me that he has filed paperwork that will, you know, start the process to hopefully get my speed humps. And even if it's not speed humps, I will take a flashing red signal. I will take bump out curbs. I want something just to slow people down and maybe provide a little more safety for my customers, the people that live in this neighborhood. It's just, I just want something. Throw me a bone. Since we heard from Andy, the 14th Ward, where Crown Candy is located, got approval for new speed humps. Alderman Rasheen Aldridge says there will be humps installed near that intersection in 2024 as long as Mayor Tashara Jones signs off on the measure. He says the speed humps will lead to traffic slowing the westbound and eastbound lanes of St. Louis Avenue. How much of a difference do speed humps make? and what other traffic calming measures should be considered. Joining me in studio to discuss those questions and respond to queries and comments from you via phone, email, or social media, we have three guests. Liz Kramer, St. Louis Community Mobility Committee co-chair. Welcome. Thank you. We also have Sean Light, Principal and Transportation Engineer at CBB Transportation Engineers and Planners. He's also an adjunct professor with the Washington University and U- UMSL Joint Engineering Program. Welcome to you as well. Thank you. And Scott Ogilvy, Complete Streets Program Manager for the City of St. Louis. Welcome back. Good afternoon. And thank you all for being here today. We want to hear from you this hour. What solutions would you like to see implemented to curb traffic violence in St. Louis? Call us at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK or send us an email at talk at stlpr.org. So the first thing that I'd like to ask Sean is a, a clarification. What is the difference, aside from a letter, <laughs> between a speed hump and a speed bump? Right, that's a great question. So back uh, in the day, um, we would see speed bumps on roads. And speed bumps are generally, um, they're shorter uh, vertical deflections that are in the roadway. You feel kind of a jar when your car goes over them. Uh, Speed humps are much more elongated, and they're designed so that you can go over them at a reasonable speed, maybe 15 or 20 miles an hour, without uh, any kind of, without any discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the speed bumps, you'll still see those in some maybe shopping center parking lots or some alleys or different ways, Um, but, but it's a design difference, one designed to allow you to pass over it at a slow speed very efficiently, and the other one um, is just kind of an older style. Okay. So 
What is it then that we know about how effective speed humps truly are? So we know that um, traffic calming, if we look at it from a broader perspective, um, and traffic calming includes both vertical deflections, which would be the speed humps. We can put raised crosswalks in, raised intersections, or vertical deflections, vertical treatments like um, curb bump outs. Uh, we have these things called a chicane, which was, creates curves in the streets or chokers, mm -hmm. which narrow the streets. They all slow traffic. Um, we know that drivers will drive at a speed that they're comfortable, they won't have negative consequences, which can either be getting a ticket or creating some kind of a crash, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we do with the physical design of the street is if we can narrow things down and make it uncomfortable for drivers to drive fast, we know that they'll slow down. So traffic calming is best done in a systematic uh, standpoint with multiple measures looking at a neighborhood as opposed to one treatment. But we know when we apply these correctly and the right combinations, it can create a, a significant difference in the speed of, of motorists. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the the specific like implements, I guess we'd call them, with something like a, a speed hump or a speed bump, what are the, the disadvantages to installing those? Does that have to do with sort of what else is going on around them? Right. So there's a lot, when we look at which treatment measure that is the most appropriate to implement, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, one of them, you know, we're looking to look at traffic speed, we're, uh, the prevailing speeds, we're going to look at volumes. So there's a difference between King's Highway and a neighborhood street, right, on what kind of uh, devices are most appropriate. We're going to look at things like stormwater. We still have to be able to drain the water off the street. And can we, how do we provide the stormwater treatments that we need to? We'll look at parking. Um, a lot of some of these devices will encroach on on street parking. Some uh, not as much. So there's lots of factors that come into play with that. There's a pretty rich toolbox of traffic calming measures that can be implemented. The good news is uh, we've been doing traffic calming in this country for decades, so we've known about this for a long time. And right now, um, we actually have some funding uh, in the region, especially in the city, to do some implementation of these in a, in a consistent uh, manner that's really going to have a positive impact on these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there are existing ways to deal with this, and yet we don't have them. So Liz, as far as speed humps go, because we were talking about those, you know, being approved, you know, with the the signature of the mayor, hopefully coming um, in the future, do speed humps get to the root of the problem? Yeah, well, I think to Sean's point, and I'm so glad that we have an engineer here to kind of talk about the specifics of how these different tools work on the street. Um, to Sean's point. Speed humps are one of many different things that we can have on the streets. And speed humps and stop signs, for example, uh, are two things that the older people have control over. And so they're able right now to write and pass legislation authorizing those to go on the street. So it's very accessible to them. It doesn't require a traffic study. But those are best used in combination with lots of other things. And we haven't prioritized as a city thinking comprehensively about how we put things like bump outs um, in combination with speed humps or stop signs mm -hmm. or other kinds of traffic calming that would really enhance the character and the quality of a neighborhood and make it a walkable place. Like the area right around St. Louis um, Avenue and 14th Street already is. Mm -hmm. So... Where we really have that opportunity is to start thinking more comprehensively um, and not just relying on our elected officials and kind of individual constituents lobbying them to make those changes happen, but mm -hmm. to be proactive as a city about what we see on the streets and what we ask for. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott, you have been on the show before um, talking about some of the things that are, be are being done sort of at that city level. What is it that you can tell us about what we can expect to see go in that is specific to speed bumps and speed humps that we've been talking about? And then some of the other things you know, that Liz have, has talked about as far as um, approaching things a little more comprehensively um, and that Sean, too, is, has spoken about regarding sort of the environment and, and other considerations to be made. Sure. Well, as, as you can see in front of me, um, we have... Uh, a very ambitious series of projects that are going to be under construction in the next several years. Um, people are going to see safety enhancements and streetscape enhancements on a lot of corridors in the city of St. Louis. Um, 
we are making these investments. Our partner agencies like Great Rivers Greenway um, are making the investments. We're working together. And MoDOT as well has really, in recent years, I think, taken a, a much keener interest in thinking about safety on those surface streets in the city that they maintain. Um, additionally, uh, we are, as we speak, essentially starting um, the city's uh, the citywide transportation and mobility plan, which will really establish a, a vision for what transportation and mobility looks like in the future. And as we get through all these current projects that are already funded and will be under construction, that process will help us think about and prioritize um, where we should go next, mm -hmm. what the remaining things to do are. And basically all of this investment is happening with a focus on safety, on improving the safety record on the streets of St. Louis um, so that fewer people are being injured and fewer people are um, unfortunately being killed uh, mm -hmm. as they navigate the city. And so every investment we make, we want to drive better safety outcomes. Mm -hmm. We do have a, a note here from Illy, who reached out to us via X, who says, several years ago, South Grand went from two lanes to one lane, including pedestrian bump outs and other calming measures. Has that improved pedestrian safety? And is it something that can be emulated in other areas of the city? We also heard from ex-user Jay Honey, who writes, Many folks have suggested raised crosswalks on Grand and other similar streets. The city always says they aren't allowed to do that. What specific reasons are they not allowed? I've seen other U.S. cities with them. Scott? Sure. So in general, what that Grand Streetscape project was about, which was probably 12 years old at least at this point, was about taking space that had previously been dedicated to vehicles and, and allowing other people to use it. So the sidewalks were expanded. There's a lot more pedestrian um, space there. And there's a more attractive streetscape, which also can have a traffic calming effect. Um, and so that approach, which is basically repurposing what we consider excess roadway space that's being used for vehicles that doesn't really need to be there for vehicles, and converting that into space people can use jogging, walking, pushing a baby stroller, riding a bike. That is a key element of a lot of projects that are currently funded. Um, if you look at Great Rivers Greenway's Brickline Greenway plans um, on streets like North Grand and Market and Spring um, and other streets as, as they get to them, we're really going to be converting a lot of that excess roadway space into something that is much more like a linear park um, so you provide a new amenity for residents to use. You also get a safer roadway. You also get a more attractive streetscape. Um, and to Andy's point um, at Crown Candy, you know, that those dangerous driving behaviors, they don't just affect people using the street. They affect people outside the street. Mm -hmm. Residents living nearby, business owners, people trying to go to school or work. Um, that that dangerous behavior spills over into the environment you know, beyond the curb, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, you know, to get into the details of what we can and can't do, I would say that we are, we're doing a lot of things in these upcoming projects that we may not have done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're um, getting more comfortable with some of the traffic calming, calming elements. And we're, a lot of these projects are just much more ambitious than they would have been five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have in the present now, though, it's a lot of people who have uh, written, who've called. We do have Ron calling from St. Louis. Ron, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Yes, um, I was going to say part of the solution has to be traffic enforcement. St. Louis is one of the only cities that I've been to where you could drive around with no license plates, a license plate that's three or four years old, so it in, empowers people to do things because they know they can't be trapped. And until they get to the point where they start requiring everyone to drive with li proper licenses and insurance, you're going to always have people that take advantage of the situation. I was at a stop the other day, and a guy came from three cars behind and went around everyone and rode right through a yellow bus with the lights out. He wasn't afraid because he didn't have any license plates. You couldn't even do anything about it because nobody could report him. Like I said, fortunately, no kid got off the bus and walked across, but he came behind three cars, went around all of us, and went right through the blinking red lights on the yellow bus. Mm -hmm. Ron, thank you so much. Liz, enforcement, 
is this something that is going to help? Yeah, this, Ron, thank you so much for raising that. And I, I feel personally terrified thinking about someone zooming around a school bus. Um, so there were a couple of issues that came up in that call that I think are important to think about. So enforcement is one of the ways that we can address reckless driving. Um, but ultimately, some of the things that happen on the street and the infrastructure changes are much more long-term sustainable for changing the way people drive. But part of what I hear in Ron's call is about a culture of dangerous driving and a culture of prioritizing automobiles over others. And that kind of belief that we care whether or not people drive dangerously on our streets, that comes at every single level. That comes with the way that we expect people to be licensed. It comes with the way that we talk about driving. It comes with the way that we um, that we see the city investing in our roads. And it's hard to believe that anyone cares if we're not seeing the investment that Scott's talking about that's mm -hmm. coming down the road. Right, right. One of the things that I do want to mention um, is that there's a lot of factors that go into the challenges around enforcement and temporary tags and having licensed cars. Um, of course, things that are local here in St. Louis and the responsibility of the city. But there's also factors at the state. And so some of those changes are now happening. Um, so one one component of that is that folks will be able to finance their sales tax for their car purchase at the point of purchase going forward, which has not been possible before, leading to many people continuing to use their temporary sales plates for an extended period of time mm -hmm. because they don't want to go back and pay that extra fee. So. Um, it, it's on our city now to make sure that we can enforce and have people driving cars that are safe and that are licensed and that we're able to follow through on. We're going to take a very quick break here, but we'll be back soon to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. Now, at the start of the show, we heard from Crown Candy Kitchen owner Andy Karantsev about the number of cars he has seen blow through stop signs at the intersection where his restaurant sits. He says he's seen that driver behavior become noticeably worse in the past five years. I know some people blamed it on COVID because there was nobody driving, so everybody drove like crazy people. And, and, and I'm like... Uh... You can't. I don't think you can blame it on COVID. I think it's just uh, a deterioration <laughs> of uh, people really just not caring about other people. So, yeah, I'd say the last five years is a, a pretty good time frame. Two thousand and eighteen, and because I mean I've been on this corner a long time, and you know you, you occasionally would see a knucklehead, but now I see him every day, every hour. You know, it's just it's just not stopped and. And it's like, how do we change the, the culture of driving in the city of St. Louis? What are the factors that lead people to not stop at stop signs or, or to drive through red lights, Sean, from your perspective as an engineer? Yeah, right. When we look at driver behavior, there's kind of three factors. We call them the three E's, right? The engineering, enforcement, and education. So... Um, when we look at engineering, the way that the streets are designed can play a uh, play a key role in that, in that we can design intersections that are harder to blow through, right? And, and that one captures your attention. So you can design an intersection in such a way that it's obvious that this is a place for pedestrians and not only for, for cars. So that's important. The enforcement is is one that's a little is, is a little tougher to do because we have a limited police force. They've got other things they're worrying about. There's equity issues that arise out of all that. And then education is important too, and that's trying to be respectful. So we've done traffic calming projects, and we've gotten comments afterwards of, you know what, I used to be able to drive through this neighborhood really quickly, and I can't do that anymore. I don't like what you did. And my answer to that is always, you're welcome. Um, that's the purpose of what we're trying to do. The people who live in this neighborhood didn't want you going through there so fast. So um, now you've had to slow down and be respectful for them. So Really, all of those things come into play. Um, we did see a lot of behavioral changes 
along with COVID. And I, you know, there's been some research done on trying to understand that. I think part of it was um, when COVID started, people were stressed, they were nervous, there wasn't as many cars on the road, you weren't as worried about, you know, again, as a society, we had bigger things to worry about than people speeding. And I think in the last year or two, maybe there's been an effort of trying to get things under control and trying to get back under control of some of these high speeds, because we have seen fatality numbers go up dramatically. It was shocking to the traffic engineering you know, community in 2020 when traffic volumes reduced significantly and at the same time fatalities went up significantly. Right. And we were like, what in the world is going on? And it was largely a product of those high speeds. Mm-hmm. Now, as you're hearing this, Scott, I mean, has that been a consideration in the plans that the, the city has made in order to calm traffic and take care of these situations that sort of are you know, within its capacity? Yeah, and I, I think engineering and roadway design can do a lot to create a safer environment for all users. There is a, a real challenge with really the pretty small percentage of drivers who are doing things that are just obviously intentionally dangerous, like, you know, just driving through a red light. Um, that is a tough challenge to solve. It cannot 100% be solved with engineering, but it can be improved, I think, uh, with, engineer- with engineering and, and design. Um, but I think the places that have really good um, safety outcomes, there's a multi-pronged approach. So there's education, there's consistent um, and proactive engineering, um, and there's an enforcement element as well. Um, so, you know, I think all of those things are, are certainly on the table. As Liz mentioned, in Missouri, we're in a pretty difficult operating environment in terms of education. Um, you know, the standards for getting a driver's license and driver's education here are, are relatively low. We, we would love to see a little more focus on that. That's something that could benefit all Missouri residents. Um, we have some ideas locally about maybe how to address some of that at, at the local level by enhancing driver's education. Um, and just to clarify on that, when we say low, what is what does that mean? Yeah, drivers in Missouri don't need any behind-the-wheel instruction with a driving instructor in order to, to receive to a, driver, get a license. Yeah, to get a driver's license. Regardless of age, right? Correct. Okay. We have a call from Dan in St. Louis. Dan, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hi. Hi. Uh, you know, this This is a topic that really uh, is really close to me. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a neighbor who was crossing Macklin, struck and hit by a car. And, uh, and I've been begging, begging the city ever since. I sent multiple emails to Joel Vollmer, um, you know, uh, Jamie Wilson, you know. And the only thing that was done, um, you know, when Joe Vaccaro was the alderman, he put in a stop sign two blocks down. Um, two people have been hit in front of Ted Drews, killed. No action has been taken. Mm-hmm. Not the city has been doing, in my view, absolutely nothing to improve uh, pedestrian safety in my neighborhood or in St. Louis. Uh, so I just wanted to get my uh, voice out there. And just, I have hope for the future, but I hope uh, Joel Vollmer and uh, Mayor Jones can take some action. Mm-hmm. Dan, thank you so much for calling. Now, Liz, what you're hearing from Dan what kinds of conversations have you heard around uh, similar experiences and what people want to see changed ASAP? Yeah, Dan's experience sounds very familiar to me. That's something we hear regularly from residents across St. Louis, that we want to see really fast response when something dangerous happens. We know we have a lot of roadways and we have a lot of deferred maintenance and there's a lot of things that can be improved. But a lot of other cities have done the work to figure out how to have those quick build projects that come in, even if they're not going to last as long as uh, redoing the entire roadway, um, but change what the experience is and make it feel like we care about what happens there. So one of the things that our committee has, uh, has suggested as a possible use for some of the RAMS funding would be to develop a team internal to the city who can get projects out on the ground, on the streets, in a much shorter turnaround than what it takes to develop the kinds of projects that are currently being implemented. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those have a two to four year lead time before we see anything. Um, And I think that the the two deaths at Ted Drew's are a really good example of that. We know that that place is a problem. 
And we think that that's somewhere that could really be improved quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that doesn't fit in the timeline of the city's development or MoDOT's development, but um, it's something we really need to do. Mm -hmm. We think of Cincinnati as a good example of that. Um, They recently invested in having a team that does that kind of on-the-ground work. Yeah. We have Elizabeth calling from the Central West End. Um, Elizabeth is at a very particular stop sign. What are you looking for? Um, hi. Hello. Uh, hi. I owned a house on the corner of Spring and Humphrey in the Tower Grove South area. Um, and I had a beautiful deck that I could sit and watch all the dogs walk by and watch all the speeders just blow through the four-way stop. Um, that neighborhood, uh, Tower Grove Heights, has put in speed bumps, but they're in the middle of the very long block. And honestly, they slow you down for maybe the first three feet. But they just don't work. Mm-hmm. What I do think works is, like, over on Compton, they'll have the big um, concrete balls in the middle of the intersection, or they will put planters there. That really makes people stop. Okay. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Liz, you, you raised your hand there. Yeah, I, I live very close to that intersection. I lived at that intersection for a while. And I, I think that's a really good example of when we feel like the street is really wide, then we feel like we should drive really fast. Okay. Uh, and so I really appreciate that Elizabeth is bringing in this idea of how do we make the street feel smaller so we're not driving at that speed through a wide intersection. Mm-hmm. Todd on X writes, my neighborhood is 90 to 95% residential. I want kids to be safe crossing the street way more than I want cars to move efficiently. St. Louis neighborhoods should cater to kids, walkers, and bicyclists. I don't care if it takes one to two minutes longer to drive through my neighborhood. Blowing stop signs and speeding is the biggest issue. I'd like to speed speed humps and raised crosswalks. So, Sean, you are not from St. Louis originally. From your observation of uh, of the way people drive and then the way that they talk about it, what do you make of you know the culture of driving here? Is it different from where you've lived in the past? I guess that's relative, right? So um, I grew up in Minnesota, and and uh, we did lived in Madison, Wisconsin for a while, and I do remember moving to St. Louis when we came down here of thinking that people drive pretty aggressively, right? And, and we learned about the St. Louis stop, which I think is partially uh, um, because the aldermen have control of where they put stop signs. It's littered with stop signs all over the place. And, and the thing is, people then don't necessarily respect those, sure. and especially if they're not enforced. So um, part of the the what we need to accomplish, if you put stop signs in conjunction with some of the bump outs we're talking about, ha- Compton, and things that would make you slow down at those intersections. So it's a combination of, of engineering design treatments that help. Mm-hmm. And also there's a there's a culture of things, right? Yeah. So if you know that I'm not going to get pulled over for running a stop sign, then, then people tend to, to disregard them. Right. Well, and then where I came from, California role is, I mean, there is a, a form, I think, a, of what we're talking about as far as stop signs go in many different places. Scott, how about you? When it comes to, to culture change around driving and movement, um, I mean, what has worked in your observation and, and what needs the most work? Yeah, the, the big picture is that in this country, you know, for 50 or 60 years post-World War II, all of our programming and funding is really aimed at expanding roadway capacity and catering to uh, the vehicle and the driver. And we are, that is changing and evolving now, uh, but we have a lot of work to do really to, I think, reestablish kind of a balanced multimodal system where safety and accessibility um, are are equal in priority or higher in priority than roadway capacity and speed and efficiency. Um, I would say that, you know, we all can play a role in this in terms of driving behavior. Um, You know, vehicles are bigger. People are looking at smartphones. Those things are driving increased crash and fatality rates, uh, we believe. So if you are a driver, um, I really encourage you to slow down, uh, set the tone for that being the norm for driving behavior. Put the phone down while you while you're driving. Um, those things 
cumulatively can have a big effect um, and, you know, make those things the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also think they're, you know, again, big picture, funding for programmatic change and investment in our infrastructure does ultimately rely on political support, support of residents to, to ask for that funding, to say they appreciate when projects are finished. So to um, residents of St. Louis who want uh, a safer environment, and you know we're hearing them from that from your callers, um, it's, it can be effective for them to provide that positive feedback, I think, to elected officials and to people like me, um, you know, city employees to say, when these changes are being made, you know, we appreciate them, we think they're effective, and that helps, I think, build or, you know, continue to show support for these types of changes. Mm -hmm. And how is it that the city is engaging with residents, Scott, um, around these kinds of questions? You know, is the city going to residents? Is it responding to them? Where is that happening? Sure. Um, So our current dynamic is that frequently residents will start with an older person, Um, And we're engaging with older people all the time on these topics. There are um, there's a lot of dialogue on on current projects, on future projects. Um, I think in a a more systematic way, as we get into the citywide transportation mobility plan, we're going to do a very big engagement process with residents across the city to really hear about the things they want to see in the transportation system and hear what their priorities are. So that in the future, we can feel confident that we know exactly what residents of the city are are asking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and then every significant project that happens, um, there's a, you know, a formal public engagement process. And even on, you know, many smaller projects begin with resident requests. And so there's a sort of an informal public engagement process that happens there, either between us, city employees, or elected officials. So I think there's a, a lot of dialogue um, and it's it's valuable to hear from residents. Yeah. We're talking this hour about traffic calming solutions, and we're also getting engagement from people who are contacting us uh, by phone as well as through social media. And on that note, ex-user Let Katie Do It writes, excessive lighting of streets not only gives drivers and pedestrians uh, a false sense of safety, but it also blinds drivers. So this is something that I had not thought about. Is that a, a consideration that is made? Liz, have you heard from the constituents that you've been in contact with, like ones who, who really have studied this, notes like that? Well, I would be curious to hear Sean's perspective on this, but I think what we've generally heard is actually that a lot of St. Louis is underlit, um, particularly when we think about places on the north side where there is really limited street lighting. A lot of times the confounding factors in dangerous crashes are because it's hard to see a pedestrian or hard to see a bicyclist who's out on the street. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would be interested in kind of what are some of the engineering perspectives on that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and in general, lighting, it does make the roads safer, uh, especially for pedestrians, right? Now, the lighting needs to be done in a correct way. So, uh, you'd like to front light pedestrians so it actually illuminates them rather than lighting from behind where they blend That's into the shadows. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of science around how you do that. But in general, to, to light areas where pedestrians are makes the road safer for them so motorists can see them easier. Mm-hmm. Now, Scott, you'd mentioned earlier something about the environment and sort of beautifying it. And we have a, a former guest on our show, Lou Ray Waldemar, and we had interviewed her about her pothole mosaic project. And she wants to know whether there are plans regarding public art and traffic calming. She says, I've seen it work in other cities. Street murals help people help make people slow down. People are outside more and there's less crime. Is that something that you have observed, Sean? So there's an interesting debate um, with street murals, right? So the federal government, through something called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, regulates traffic signs, striping, all those things. And in a strict legal sense, uh, street art isn't legal. Now, on the sidewalks, it's fine. Um, So there's a discussion occurring throughout the country right now about how to incorporate more of that, more decorative sidewalks, um, those types of things. So, but I think to create a more inviting environment, 
um, absolutely creates a, a sense of a neighborhood, a sense where people it, it's a place for people and not just for cars and, and gets people to slow down. Mm-hmm. I want to come back to that South Grand project. Sure. Um, so there's a program called the Great Streets Program, which East West Gateway runs. That was the first East, uh, Great Streets project in the St. Louis region. Um, and it's been replicated in some other places. But the point behind that project is to create streets that are more economically um, vital, right, that have better economics and are great places to walk and all those other things. So there's a combination, and I think that's been a theme of this show, of using the, the, the environment around the street, using, again, educational ways, using street design to try to, what we're trying to accomplish is a sense of place in that street where when you're driving through it, you feel like you're in a place that you you will have the res- you'll respect that area more because it's it's a neighborhood and people are there and you're just not trying to pass through it. Right, right. Liz, in addition to the South Grand project, you told our producer Emily Woodbury that you're hopeful that St. Louis can reduce its crash um, its crash fatalities and injuries via several city projects that are now in the works. What are those? Yeah, well, Scott has the list in front of him, so I might ask him <laughs> to actually cover the details. But I think there's a there's a large number of projects that do things that are similar to South Grand and, as Scott mentioned, go beyond what we've seen in St. Louis before. Um, so that includes things like doing road diets so that there are less lanes on the street when we know our streets were built for a million people and a streetcar line that we don't have anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think particularly important to me is that many of those improvements will also include substantial improvements to ADA access, really good curb cuts, smooth sidewalks, so that people who are getting around in wheelchairs or with assisted devices or with strollers um, are really able to safely walk from place to place and not kicked out into the street. Mm -hmm. Scott, what is the status on these projects? How do you expect them or, or hope that they will improve conditions? Yeah, so we have quite a list of projects. Um, there's uh, to kind of group them together. Uh, we have projects that are funded um, through ARPA funding. That federal funding is allowing us to do a lot of corridor um, maintenance and safety projects. Those corridors, Goodfellow Union, Kings Highway, Jefferson, um, and Grand, are all currently in uh, engineering, kind of preliminary engineering right now. Um, we are going to finish engineering by next year and bid those projects out, and we expect that that most of that construction work to happen in 2025. Um, there's some very ambitious Great Rivers Greenway projects, which are touching on some major arterial streets, uh, which I also mentioned. Those are going to be coming 2025, 2026. Those will be under construction. Um, and we have other city-funded or partner projects, projects like 20th Street, which we're reconstructing, Tower Grove Connector Project, those should both be under construction next year. Um, and we have a little bit smaller projects kind of throughout the city. And so, uh, you know, what I am excited or optimistic about is that we have, I think, high quality projects funded in design um, across the city, touching really every part of the city, and many of which are. Are, will be building these projects in some of the areas of streets that have the, the worst safety record today. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope, you know, I hope those projects pay off and improve the safety record, and I hope they then allow us to get to the next phase of projects um, on the streets we're not touching in this round. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis.
Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.